evening. I'm Kathy Cortez, and I am co-president of the League of Women Voters of the Palatine area. And that includes uh, the vast majority of the area for uh, Consolidated School District 15, which is the uh, school board race that we're here to uh, witness tonight. Uh, as you may already know, League of Women Voters is a uh, nonpartisan or political organization. We don't support, oppose, or recommend any candidate for office. In fact, any viewpoints voiced by the candidates tonight are theirs and theirs alone. We do not fact check candidates during our forums. To ensure the questions for today's forum were fair and unbiased, and that they represented a balance of issues. Those of you who registered online are already aware that we asked for your input on questions that we should ask this evening. And we also asked the candidates for input if they so uh, desire. We prepared them in advance and they were prioritized uh, based on the input that we received. And those that were either deemed negative or corrected at single candidate or a set of candidates were eliminated. Because questions were prepared in advance, we are not taking questions from the audience tonight. So uh, we will be focusing on all of the many wonderful things the candidates up here to tell you tonight. It's their night, so we do ask for uh, your cooperation in uh, not a lot of applause or noise making or throwing out comments while, uh, while or after the candidates have spoken. And so without further, I'm pleased to introduce our moderator for today's forum. Uh, he has to turn around and give you a quick look. Ginger Wheeler, she's been a member of the League of Women Voters for over 25 years. Over that time, she's held every office in her Glen Ellen League and helped usher them into the digital age by kickstarting their website and social media efforts. She's a trained moderator who has about 10 years of experience conducting candidate forums, so we're delighted that she's able to stay uh, with us this evening. And we also have Susan Kerr, who is going to be the timer tonight, and Ginger will explain a little bit more about that in just a second. All right, about that. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's my pleasure to be with you this morning, or this evening, sorry, to moderate this candidate forum. As a resident of Glen Ellen, I am not eligible to vote in this election. So I have been asked to serve as an impartial facilitator for this discussion, and I am a volunteer. Um, I want to take a few minutes to explain the format and the rules of the forum. All of the candidates were contacted by email and have agreed to abide by the ground rules provided by the League of Women Voters, which are as follows. The candidates have agreed to the speaking order, which we determined earlier, and I will rotate this order during the forum for the questions. Each candidate will have one minute for an opening statement, and next they will have um, one minute to answer their questions. The moderator, I believe, will repeat the questions if necessary. The candidates may request a rebuttal. Each candidate may use a maximum of two rebuttals. Rebuttals will be timed and limited to 30 seconds each. At the end, each candidate will have a one minute closing statement. Uh, your timekeeper today is Susan Kern. Candidates will be given a 30 second, and then a 15 second warning. Um, so candidates, when you see the stop sign go up, then you will wrap it up. <laughs> I know it's gonna be hard in one minute, that's very short. Um, we will ask each question of each candidate. You all get to answer every single question. And we have asked you to treat each other with respect and kindness, not to interrupt each other. If you need to rebut, then use that, that rebutting uh, process. Um, okay, so then, now we're going to, okay, yes. Candidates who do not comply with these rules and time limits may be interrupted and the moderator me, and you move to the next question. I usually don't have to do that. Um, today's forum will be taped for the League of Women Voters to use to educate the public. A video of this forum will be available early next week on the League of Women Voters of the Palatine area website. The candidates have all agreed to this. No campaign signs, buttons, or partisan materials are allowed in the room where the forum is being conducted. 
and the League of Women Voters claims copyright ownership of all the recordings and transcripts produced from this event and reserve the right to publicize the forum. No voice image or other duplication of the forum may be used by a candidate's representative or campaign in any campaign advertising. Today we will hear from the candidates running for Community Consolidated School District 15. There are five candidates vying for three seats. With us today and on our ballot are Justin Heggy, Samantha Ader, Wenda Hunt, Zubair Khan, and Chris Sardis. Um, I want to thank all of you for your participation and congratulate you. We will begin with your one minute opening statements first. Um, and by prior agreement, we, we decided together on this order. They're going to go left to right. Um, okay, so now we have a Can I answer a question? Can I briefly oh, ask course. you? Okay. Um, we signed our, um, our forms for participation and actually said for opening and close, it's, one, uh, it's 90 seconds. 90 seconds. I am looking at this. It says opening statement, one and a half minutes. You are absolutely correct. So, is everybody okay with that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Where's our chief? Where's the chief in the chart? Okay? Uh, yes, thank you for pointing that out. Okay. So an opening statement and a closing statement, one and a half. I was going to say two, it's very short. Okay, but one and a half. Okay, so now we begin. Um, and, okay, so we will go ahead and get started. And Justin, you get to go first with the opening statement of one and a half minutes. All right, thank you. Hello everybody, thank you for having me here. Um, that means a lot to be able to express my, my thoughts on running and why I'm running to, to this audience. You guys are great and um, you're important. Um, a little bit about myself, uh, I'm Justin Heggie. I moved to Palatine six and a half years ago with my wife, Lauren. Um, we fell in love with the community. My, my wife always wanted to live in Palatine, uh, grew up in Hoffman Estates. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> Anyways, um, so long story short, uh, my, my, I started noticing that friends and family with young children started moving out of the community. Um, and specifically District 15 has lost 9% of their student population since 2018. Um, that's become a problem and I think it's because um, it's becoming less and less affordable. Property taxes here are the second highest in the nation. Um, there's uh, some problems with uh, proficiency in some of the core subjects. Um, I thought that I could bring my skill set. Uh, my background is public relations. I go, or I mean, sorry, public administration. Uh, and I have a skill set that I think I can hone in on. Correcting some of those issues, making a better school environment for everybody and improving um, the overall uh, district. All right. Uh, thank you very much to our forum hosts, uh, our moderators, Winston Campus, my fellow candidates, uh, and our audience for being here tonight. My name is Samantha Ayer, and I am a mom, a homeowner, an education nonprofit leader, and a proud current board member of District 15. I have dedicated my career to ensuring every child, regardless of their background, has access to a high quality education. In my current role, I oversee talent and operations for a national nonprofit working to elevate the voice and leadership of Latinos in the education sector. As board members, Wenda Zubair and I have delivered on the commitments we made four years ago. We passed the Moving 15 Forward Plan, expanded mental health support for students, modernized our curriculum, and expanded culturally responsive teaching practices. We also safely navigated the COVID-19 pandemic and we have kept the district in a healthy financial position. We have laid a strong foundation, but there is still work to do. If reelected in this next term, we will focus on building a future ready district. We will implement the Moving 15 Forward Plan and a new strategic plan that sets a bold vision for our district. We will make sure all students get access to the education they deserve. And we will 
maintain a diverse and high functioning uh, Board of Education, support our staff, and continue expanding community engagement. I look forward to answering questions about our vision for the path forward in tonight's forum. Thank you so much. Next, Wenda Hunt. Thank you, League of Women Voters, Vincent Kent, ATA, for hosting this event. Um, my name is Wenda Hunt. I've probably served this board for the past four years. For those of you out there who've already found your candidate, um, thank you so much for doing your research. I am speaking now to those of you that are undecided, uh, that do not have not made the decision on who you're going to vote for. Um, you may have heard that uh, District 15 passed uh, a $93 million ref referendum overwhelmingly in this uh, community. And this is more than just building repairs. It's um, restructuring the very future of District 15 with a new strategic plan a curriculum refresh and boundary changes that will impact so many schools. There is so much work to be done. And we want to ensure that the children have the resources and the environment that supports learning. We want to ensure that educators are supported through all these different changes. And that the board works together to make student-centered decisions. That they can consider the diversity of all um, viewpoints and that we are not distracted by issues that do not affect our school community. These past four years have been a labor of love for me, and um, I ask for your vote to complete the work we started four years ago. Um, vote for Inner Han Khan, equal fourth. Thank you. Sabir Khan. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you, thanks to the League of Women Voters and the volunteers. Yes. For, thanks to the League of Women Voters and all the volunteers for putting this for putting this together. Thanks to Winston Campus for hosting. My name is Zubair Khan. For the last eight years, I've served on the District 15 Board of Education. I've spent my entire life in this area. I went to Marion Jordan, and then I went to Sunland Junior High. My wife also went to District 15 schools before we finally met at Fram High School. Full circle, my son and my two daughters have also attended District 15 schools. I'm running for re-election with Wenda Hunt and Samantha Ader because this community overwhelming, overwhelmingly approved the referendum in November 2022. We put the Moving 15 Forward plan together, a plan that will finally give this district full day kindergarten, much needed capital improvements to every school and middle school. These were the mandates that when we were elected, four years ago, and we have kept our promises. I'm proud of the fact that we have added more mental health professionals in our schools. We have revamped our curriculum with evidence-based decisions and an increased emphasis on literacy. We handled COVID-19 with a balanced, science-based approach, getting our kids back to school as soon as possible. I'm also running because all of us are champions of equity in our district. Our student body speaks different languages, and many have financial restraints. This is today's District 15. We have taken an approach that meets the students where they are. Thank you. Both of them. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Chris Sargis. I'm also a candidate and I'm first want to start by thanking the League of Women Voters for hosting us. I want to thank my fellow candidates for joining us here today and I want to thank all of you for taking the time on a uh, weekday evening uh, to come and listen to us and uh, make your decision. Uh, I'm a uh, Palestine resident. I've been in Palestine for the last 15 years. I grew up down the road in Schaumburg. But I came back here to Palestine because I knew the schools were good. And I want to give my children a great education because that's what it is all about. It's about getting our kids educated. And I sent all three of my children through District 15. I was happy to do so. They had a wonderful experience. But what we've seen lately is academic performance lagging in District 15. We're going to talk more about the details and the numbers, but we've seen performance decline over the last few years. We've seen uh, against ourselves, and we've seen uh, our performance be uh, poor relative to our neighboring district, District 54, just to the south of us. We need change. We need stronger leadership on the board to move the district forward. I actually think that the moving 15 forward plan that was passed, the $93 million referendum that was passed, was fantastic. I voted for it as a resident of this district. But we need strong accountability and leadership to ensure that it's spent the right way. That everybody up here is right. This is a critical time. We're moving to a full day kindergarten. We're moving to a middle school model. We need proper oversight. We need strong leadership on the board, not just to listen, but to provide guidance to our administrators and our teachers 
ending so we can provide a safe, nurturing, learning environment for our students and our staff. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so now we will start with our questions and we'll have one minute answers. Samantha Ader will answer the first question first. What is your position on the hiring of a lobbyist jointly with two other school districts for the proposed legislation about the potential fares development? And what is your position on that proposed legislation? Sure, so I'm absolutely in support of the lobbyist. I voted in support of it uh, at the board meeting. And that's for a couple of reasons. The first one primarily is that we need to have an influential seat at the table, both for the sake of our schools and our school community and the education we're providing our kids, but also for the taxpayers in our community as well. Um, so that particular legislation, from my understanding, is this is just a starting place um, and that it's going to evolve very quickly, which is why we needed to have eyes, ears, and a voice in Springfield as decisions continue to evolve. Um, so at this time, I'm not in support of the legislation that's currently proposed, um, but look forward to understanding more as it uh, evolves in the coming weeks. Thank you. And by the hand. I think I too am in support of um, hiring a lobbyist. I also voted for that. Um, I wanted to ensure that the, uh, the potential for the bears coming over and um, having uh, property development um, would, we, we need to ensure that the 354 more students that may come into our schools, um, that we have them adequately covered, that we ensure that we have enough space in our schools for that, and we need to make sure that we have a um, Connection with uh, with various uh, so that so that we are in a good position um, moving forward. Thank you. Mayor Khan. I'm also in support of uh, hiring the the, the lobbies. <laughs> All right. I'm also in, in support of hiring the, uh, the lobbyists. It's obviously something that we need to have a seat at the table. There's a lot of different statutes that are already that are out there where, where we need to be vigilant about uh, how exactly that's going to affect our children. We know that the proposed development includes a, a number of residential uh, 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 parts. A, there's a large residential impact, so we are going to get more students if that goes through. And for that, we need to make sure that any TIF bills or any, any uh, special area bills are such that the, the, the school board and the school districts are not um, you know, removed from getting the, the, the funds that they need for each one of these children. So as long as our children, they, there's some great TIF reform out there that, we're, that I'm excited about, including ones where, where school districts can opt out of that. And I think we should uh, explore that and, and, and do that for the sake of the children. Thank you. Chris Darkett. Well, I think, excuse me, I think this is a great question for us to lead off with because it shows that even though there's five candidates up here vying for three spots, not every not every issue is going to be uh, one of disagreement. This is an area where I think we all agree that uh, one, bears coming to this area is a fantastic thing. Two, hiring a lobbyist is absolutely the right thing to do. Partnering with other districts is absolutely the right thing to do. We should be working cooperatively with the district around us because we're all being impacted. This is about, in this particular case, it's about anticipating issues that might come up from new students coming into the district. There's capacity, as Mr. Hagee mentioned, there's been a decrease in enrollment, but of course it's where is the new students coming in, what area, what is the impact of busing in local schools. But most importantly, it impacts the taxpayers and homeowners of this district. We need to make sure that any legislation, through our lobbyists, that we're a voice for the taxpayers and homeowners in this district. We're already incredibly heavily taxed. We need to make sure that all the positive benefits that the uh, bears are gonna bring us don't bring uh, uh, overwhelming negatives with it as well financially. Thank you, and Justin Eddie. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, I don't think that there financially is probably a bigger issue on the table than the bears moving in and potentially getting a full TIF district name um, granted to them. So I have a background working for a public policy think tank. I've done TIF reform work before. I know that there's been nonprofit groups reaching out to the board trying to assist them in this, uh, but haven't gotten any word back from them. So they just hired a lobbyist. I think it's a little late in the process to start doing this. Um, I think you need some leadership on the board 
if this TIF district goes through and we don't have leadership on the board really aggressively pushing so that we don't get shorted, we will have just raised $93 million in property taxes and potentially we will lose out to $70 million a year in property taxes if the Bears' full development is given uh, full TIF district. So that's one of the reasons I'm running to make sure that they can still develop, but we don't get shorter by it because uh, we already have very high property taxes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Wenda Hunt will start the next, answer the next question first, which is, which proposed or existing district programs do you consider most important to facilitating the ability of disadvantaged kids to be successful in school? Wanda? So the question is which programs, um, proposed programs, um, do I consider most important? Uh, proposed or existing? Okay. All of them. We, uh, unfortunately, um, unfortunately are in, in a district that's complicated. Um, we have 11 of our 20 schools that are Title I schools. So we have to address students where they're at. Um, we have, we're public school, that's what, that's what we're made out of. Um, one of the things that we have implemented right now is culturally responsive learning. And that's um, looking at the student body and, um, and having a teaching style that addresses how they learn best. Um, so that's one of the important goals. But also we have to address mental health. Um, stress brains can't, can't learn, and we talked about that in the last board meeting. It is important that we address um, the environment first before we can um, move on with anything else. Thank you. So there I. I would say that for the disadvantaged children, and we have a lot of them, and what's, what makes our, our district so wonderful that we have a, a great diverse, uh, diversity, but I would say one of the most important things is just the emphasis on literacy. Now, we just recently revamped our, our, our English and our, and our literacy curriculum because what studies have shown is that the, the students, if they're disadvantaged, they speak a different language as their, as their first language, they need to learn to read first, even if it's in their own language, because that's going to affect all the other subjects. I mean, even math. So you think about, well, what's, what's reading have to do with math? It has everything to do with math. So we need to increase the literacy rate of, the, 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 of all of our children more particularly the ones who are in, in a disadvantaged situation. I agree with what Wendy said as well about some of the other programs like uh, our, our CLR is very important, mental health is very important. It's a, it's a multi-pronged thing, but I would point out literacy in particular. Thank you. And Chris Starbucks. I think that, uh, frankly, all of our children in this district can help. Uh, we need to focus on our disadvantaged children. We also need to focus on those academic achievers who are maybe not getting the support they need to reach their full potential. We have the ability to do it. This is a well-off district. But the problem we're seeing right now is that academic performance is declining in this district. We need to dig into why that is. And it's not just our disadvantaged children. It's not just minority children or English language learners. It's our African American children, our Caucasian children, our Hispanic children, our Asian American children, they all are performing worse on tests than they did just three years ago. And this isn't a random statistic, this is the Illinois State Board of Education's own assessment of the children in this district. So I would love to see us dedicate, I love what we saw in the last board meeting from the staff about mental health resource for, resources for our children, incredibly important. But I'd like us to dig in, why do we need more uh, people uh, addressing English as a second language learners? Do we need more people uh, addressing gifted children and making sure that they stay engaged in the classroom? We absolutely have to dig in on what the problem here is. Thank you. And Justin Hagee, same question. Yeah, it's, it's kind of tough to pinpoint one exact area, but I, I do believe um, that, you know, uh, students that have English as a second language Definitely, I, I hear from the public that they need more resources, especially in those schools that are primarily the, the largest area where there's uh, students that have English as a second language. Um, but proficiency overall is, is, is down as well. So I, I think that uh, focusing on the basics, uh, services for students that have English as a second language, um, mental health issues definitely with how uh, you know, the schools were impacted with COVID being locked down. I've heard from many teachers that there's a lot of behavioral and mental health issues that have developed because kids were out of the classroom too long. 
uh, different mandates, those things had real impacts. So that should be a focus area as well. Um, and if we come together on all those things, we can raise our proficiency out of the uh, 30 percentile for some of the basics. Thank you. Yeah. And Samantha Ayer. Yep, I could talk about this for an hour, so I'm gonna try to be very brief and succinct. Um, but the most important programs to me are one, bringing full day kindergarten to the district. If we're investing in our earliest learners, that's gonna pay dividends for the years to come, both in District 15, high school, college, and beyond. Um, mental health support, as Wenda said, if our kids are facing mental health challenges, facing trauma, they can't learn. That's science. And so we have to make sure that we're meeting our kids where they are and getting them the support that they need. Uh, third is multilingual programs. So our district is 36% Latino, 27% are English learners. We have to make sure that we are supporting our students who are coming, who are either new immigrants or have been in this country for a while, but have been facing opportunity gaps and barriers to get the education they deserve. And finally, parent and family engagement. We have programs like our bilingual parent liaisons, um, that are encouraging family engagement, and we know that that pays dividends for academics as well. Thank you. Okay, Zvir Khan, we'll start with you for this next question. What do you consider to be the district's top two to three spending priorities over the next five years? Well, I think the spending priorities over the, over the next five years we obviously have this referendum that is going to be implemented, and that is going to be comprehensive. So what we're looking to see with, with, with that is construction on every single one of the buildings is having significant uh, changes to make the, the, the spaces more conducive to the new program that's coming, including full day kindergarten, including uh, converting to middle school programs. And so there's a lot of construction work that will be going on, but along with that, we're going to be spending, uh, you know, for the personnel to, to, to have a school day kindergarten, which is more personnel that we need. Uh, we'll be spending more on, on uh, curriculums as we go through the cycle. We, we've been having, uh, you know, very important uh, refresh cycles of all of our curriculum. That will continue uh, as we get into more subjects. Uh, and so I think that will probably be the, the main areas of uh, spending. Thank you. Chris Stargis. Yeah, I'd say the top three are going to be driven by the priorities that were set with the, um, the Move Forward Plan uh, that was passed this past November. First of all, school maintenance upgrades are incredibly important. We need to improve that we're going to audit and then improve the security of our schools where necessary and ensure that our children and our staff remain safe in those buildings. And we're going to upgrade and maintain those buildings as necessary as well. So I, I, uh, well, that's, that's priority number one. And that was what the, the, the bulk of the uh, majority of the referendum was about. Second, we need to, we're going to be shifting to full day kindergarten and also to a middle school model. There's going to be investment required to make that happen. Different busing plans, different housing plans for students in school, various schools, et cetera. And then lastly, as I mentioned, we have to improve our academic performance and we have to be willing to commit the funds available to this district to that, whether that means hiring more staff to teach uh, English language learners English at a faster pace, hiring more uh, program administrators for gifted programs, hiring more teachers in the classroom where we're short staff. What it take, whatever it takes based on the analysis we need to do to improve our children's academics. Thank you. Justin Hagee. Yeah, thank you. Um, as everybody else kind of uh, leaded to, the Moving 15 Forward uh, plan that's in place, it requires a lot of construction, a lot of procurement, a lot of uh, money going out. Um, I would be focused uh, to make sure that we got the best deals when those contracts were fulfilled that we're reducing costs where we need to, redundancies where, where we can reduce those. I'm, I'm very concerned, we, we have a lot of resources right now, and we just get, got a lot more resources. Um, I, I would like to find ways to reduce um, the spending of the district um, so that we don't have to go back to the taxpayer again on a regular basis. Um, we you know we received $20 million of ESSER COVID relief funds. We had more than, uh, we're in excess of our reserves that are recommended. We have a lot of money and resources right now. I'd like to see a way to constrain our spending so that we can give a little relief to the homeowners. Thank you. And Samantha Ader. Uh, so echoing the Moving 15 Forward Plan, I think we all know that that's a big ticket item for the district, 186 million to be exact. 
Um, fortunately, though, we have come under budget on all of our bids thus far, which is good news uh, for our community. Uh, and then the second, I would say, is recruiting, developing, and retaining high-quality staff. We are only as good as a district as the staff that we have in our buildings. And our educators, folks who are in the classroom, our support staff are exhausted. It has been an incredibly challenging last few years. We're facing shortages all over the country in terms of educators that are leaving the workforce in droves. If we don't invest and support our staff, we cannot close our academic gaps. We cannot support the mental health needs of our students, uh, and we cannot build the best community and the best districts that we can be. Thank you. Linda. You know, in terms of um, spend, I think we all agree um, that with a $93 million referendum, that we do have to focus on building repairs and upgrading our, our buildings so that we can um, pull through the, all the programs that we had um, discussed. But really, I believe it's important to address um, the real issue here. In terms of the ESSER funds, um, I know, Justin, you guys talked about it, that money has been spent. We um, are a district, there, there's misinformation in the community that we have an excess of funds. Um, in true reality, our funds are the minimum required by the We We are um, running on a shoestring budget in order to pro provide the services that we have for these um, students, and we have to keep that in mind. Um, our teachers are um, do not have all the resources that they need in order to provide for our students. And, we, and that is the, the real issue. Thank you. Okay, uh, Chris Stargis, you will answer this question first. How should the school board balance the need to provide a quality education with the need to respond to local taxpayer burden? Well, I, the question is how, how do we balance the educational needs of the, of the district with the taxpayer burden? Yes. I don't see those in conflict at all. I think that's actually the, the main job of the board, or one of the main jobs of the board. The academic performance of our children is incredibly important. We've seen it decline over the past three years. We need to see it improve. We've seen it decline relative to ourselves. And we're also eight to 10 points behind in terms of uh, people reading at or above grade level, people in math doing math at or above grade level, across all racial groups and across all grade levels, just compared to our neighbors in District 54. Now, if we have unique challenges, we need to dig in and find them, but the purpose of the board is to direct and to provide guidance to the superintendent and partner with the superintendent. I'm very glad to see you is, is here tonight. Thank you for attending. So that we can uh, be fiscally responsible in going after these problems. We can prioritize the right issues to ensure their children are being educated. I don't see those as being in conflict at all. I see it as actually the, one of the main responsibilities of this board. Thank you. Justin, Peggy? Yeah, thank you. Um, it's one of the reasons I'm running. Um, my background is public administration. Uh, I go into agencies. I currently work for the EPA. I'm the regional manager. Before that, I was manager for Department of Children and Family Services. I go into agencies. I try to find redundancies try to find areas that we can reduce costs and also provide the tools that are needed for public uh, servants that are doing valuable work. Um, I want to come in, bring that skill set so that uh, we don't have to raise property taxes and we don't have to continually um, come to the taxpayer's door and knock on it asking for more money when we already have the second highest property taxes in the nation. We're pricing young families out of the district, whether people want to admit it or not. I see it, it's statistics, that's what's happening. Um, I don't wanna move out of the district. I wanna raise a family here and I'm trying for my first, so that's why I'm in this and I hope I can bring that skill set to the board. Thank you. Samantha Ader. So of course we need to be smart with our budget. Um, one of the things that Dr. Hines and our chief school business officer implemented upon her tenure is that we shifted to a zero-based budgeting model, which means departments can't roll over budget year over year without verifying and proving essentially why they need those dollars and how it benefits kids. Um, so that is one way that we've been uh, fiscally responsible with our budget. The other thing is we need to take a longer term view. As we know with the Moving 15 Forward plan, we did have deferred maintenance over a period of time. 
And so we work to, um, with Dr. Hines and our facilities team to build a five-year uh, facilities and maintenance plan to make sure that we're keeping up with the maintenance that we need to do on our buildings um, in a longer term. And then we also need to know when to double down and when to invest. For example, one for every dollar that you invest in early childhood education, you get three dollars back as a community. So we have to understand that investing in our kids is not a stupid investment, it's one that's dire for our families and for our community. If you would like me to repeat the question, I'm happy to do it. Yes, so, please. How should the school board balance the need to provide a quality education with the need to respond to local taxpayer burden? Fiscal responsibility is, a, is the responsibility of the board, but I do want to um, point out specific facts. Um, in Illinois, uh, um, we spend an average of sixteen thousand dollars per pupil. That's a, that goes that remains true for District 15, but our local um, our surrounding suburbs. District 54, for example, they spend $18,000 per student. And when you look at our test scores, they're about the same. Um, cumulatively, 40, about 45 in math for both our school districts. Um, in ELA, um, yes, District 54 actually has a higher ELA score, 52 to our 46. Keep that in mind on how much we spend for our students and the return on that investment. Um, District 15 staff have a Herculean effort to try to um, teach our students with a budget that doesn't um, exactly meet the needs um, of the entire district. Thank you. Thank you. And Zubair Khan, same yeah. question. Yeah, I mean, I think that balancing is, is one of the key functions. I mean, I think when it comes to uh, making sure that we are good stewards with the public's money, I think uh, our budgeting that has been uh, revamped over the last few years, basically what Sam described, you know, the money that we get from, from our private property taxes, which is the vast majority of the dollars we get, I mean, that is uh, constrained by CPI or, or, or the, you know, the, how the prices and inflation. And so that's kind of a set amount that we get. I think that the important thing to realize, this is where I kind of fall on this, is we provide, we're, we're public school. We provide services to everybody, including special ed uh, children, who, special needs children who, in this district, we don't farm them out to other other schools, we, we have it in-house. So when we talk about we want to do all these things for the kids, but yet we're talking about how do we give money back to the, to the um, taxpayers. I like to just be honest, like, we got issues, we have to, we have to spend money to, to, to help all of our children. If you have that mindset, you're gonna have to spend money. I just like to do a rebuttal regarding the test scores. Not so much rebuttal, just to clarify the record, because I want to make sure that the audience isn't confused by what I'm talking about when I talk about the decline in academic performance and, and what I think what Samantha was just saying regarding test scores. This is the Illinois State Board of Education uh, saying that we have 42% of our children meeting proficiency in English language learning. District 54, 56%. Math proficiency, 43% versus 54% down the road. And that, Holds in very to varying degrees across grade levels and across uh, uh, racial categories as well. Thank you. I, I, I would like to do uh, my, one of my 30 second rebuttals. Okay. Go right ahead. I think that when we're, it's, it's an important point because we sometimes do compare ourselves with, with District 54 because they're right next door, but it's like comparing apples and oranges in, in reality. As we've discussed, 11 of our schools are Title I schools, which means that they are the types of schools that you know, have free and reduced meals, they don't have the same means, and that's not to denigrate anybody. I'm, I'm fine with that. That's, that, that those are our, our children as well. Uh, District 54 has a different tax base, they have Woodfield Mall, and they don't have the same children. I think we, we should just keep that in mind when we're comparing the two. Thank you. Okay, next we're going back to Justin, starting at the beginning. Okay, this question is, setting aside the existing process, please describe what your ideal process would be to obtain board approval on a new math and science curriculum recommended by staff. I should say, on new math and science curriculums recommended by staff. So. The ideal process. The ideal process, okay. Um, so, I mean, if staff were coming uh, with recommendations on a new curriculum, um, I, 
I would probably put some kind of uh, communication out to see if there's other recommendations, other curriculum uh, from other districts that are competitive to it. We'd put them all on the table. We'd have sessions where we would look at different curriculum. Um, probably the board would discuss. Um, uh, it would be, we'd discuss that. We'd look at our top options for a new curriculum, and then we probably I would like to try to make it transparent, have some parental involvement, present those things to the public before there's any type of vote from the board. Um, I think that should be the same for any type of curriculum that. Um, there should be both board input, teacher input, and parent input. Great, thank you. Samantha Ader. Anybody wants to make a repeat question, just let me know. Thank you. Um, I would say, I think we actually have a very strong current process in that we do take a committee approach to curriculum review that has the input of a variety of stakeholders, different types of staff. Um, what I think might be um, helpful as we continue to move forward with different curriculum refresh is actually finding a way to include student voice, especially in some of our junior highs. Um, that's something that we've seen in different pockets across the country where student voice, even at the junior high level, has been very influential in terms of sharing how uh, curriculum content and the ways in which we're educating our kids can continue to improve. Um, and that should also include family engagement. Um, the second that I think would be um, helpful is to also expand um, and be able to, <laughs> that does go fast, uh, and be able to highlight uh, some of the results that that curriculum has helped to uh, lead in other communities and other districts where it's used um, so that we can take lessons from other districts that have implemented that curriculum and learn from the, uh, the challenges and opportunities that they had. Thank you. Linda Hunt. Thank you. Um, my background is um, I'm a clinical pharmacist, um, so science is important to me. Um, so I utilize the scientific process in all decision making. In terms of our um, curriculum provision, that goes through our RTM process. Um, it's, it's a committee approach. There's its evidence-based practices, which is very important to me. And then there's staff, um, there's statewide standards that are um, included in the, in the entire process. So when we think about curriculum review, we need to identify the problem. Where are our kids lacking? Um, we need to review what happens after we implement and um, engage those outcomes so that we can make a, um, an informed decision on whether or not we continue with that curriculum. Um, I need to state that if I trust the T15 curriculum, and when we don't trust curriculum, we are both public education. That is important. But as board members, we need to continue to ask questions about the curriculum and not be transparent with our um, with our community about what we're doing, just so that there is no confusion. Thank you. Thank you. Zubair, uh, same question. Well, when it comes to uh, you know, curriculum, math, and science, I think you mentioned, you mentioned specifically, I, while I do think that there has to be some initial committees, and we do have committees where we have all the different stakeholders talk about it, we do have to realize that teaching is a profession just like any other profession uh, out there so they are the experts uh, in this field and they do get deference as it would be for, for any field you don't tell an engineer how to make his car um, but so I think that's very important another thing that hasn't been mentioned so far is I think uh, we need to make sure that whatever curriculum we do the biggest part of it is the professional development um, if you have curriculum new fresh fresh books fresh curriculum it's all for not if you don't have time where you are actually explaining to the teachers how to use this brand new material. So I think that is uh, just as important. We've started to do a lot more professional development over the last few years, uh, uh, as, as a parent can probably uh, attest to when the kids are at home. So. Thank you. And Chris Sargis. So the question is about our ideal process for curriculum development for math and science? Yes. Okay. Well, the board's job is not to design the curriculum. The board has an oversight role for the uh, school district and that's the role we should exercise so ideally the superintendent and her staff are helping pull together what the curriculum should be ideally we're taking an outcome based approach so we're looking at what are the deficiencies in our curriculum that we need to address what are the deficiencies in student outcomes that we need to address 
and we're addressing those with the curriculum. Hopefully we'll have teacher input because as Mr. Khan just said, the teachers who actually need to teach this material to our children need to understand what's going on. They need to understand. They're, they're at the ground level. They're interacting with these children every single day. They know what works. They know what doesn't work. They know what concepts children are understanding and what they don't. They're a critical part of the input process. And lastly, of course, as Mr. Hayes said, yes, we should have parental involvement because at the end of the day, our parents are entrusting their children to the, the district. They should at least have a visibility to what the curriculum is so they can voice any concerns. And again, the board can evaluate that in context with the teacher input, the superintendent's input, and staff input. And hopefully we can come to a, a, a board approval. Thank you. Samantha Ader, you will answer the next question. First, Mr. Um, reflecting on the last question, how would your ideal process change, if at all, for board approval of books and curriculum for history and sex ed? I wouldn't change the process. I think we should be standardizing our process across, across all curriculum um, because we don't want personal religious, any type of ideology that might influence the decisions that we're making as a public school district. We have a process put in place for a reason. We engage a variety of stakeholders for a reason. And so it's essential that we are following similar processes no matter what the topic is. And I think sex ed is a perfect example in the way that we're approaching that in District 15. Right now, it's going through our current process of our refresh of our curriculum on the scheduled time frame that it should, so that as a board, we aren't pulled into, part of our role is in some ways rising above some of the ideological battles that happen outside of our schools um, to make sure that we're preparing our kids in a way that strikes a balance, um, is honest, and reflects the identities uh, and the backgrounds of the students that are in front of us. Thank you. Linda, can you repeat the question again? Happy to. Setting aside, I'm oh, sorry, we're at number six now. Reflecting on the last question, which is about the ideal process, how would your ideal process change, if at all, for board approval of books and curriculum for history and sex ed? So teaching and learning has a um, library collection development review process. Um, there's also a book um, objection process in place. That is um, standard. This, this is not, this is nothing new to District 15. That objection process actually um, was put in place in 1994. If parents have any concerns about books, um, whether they're in our collection or not, they should actually choose to opt out of it. Um, so you can request for reevaluation of um, library materials specifically for your child so that those books are available to other students if other parents want their children to be able to read those books. So um, I believe in um, having a voice and I believe in the First Amendment and the, the, the right um, to having books in the library. Absolutely. So here, Khan. Yeah, I, I also wouldn't um, change the process. I mean, these subjects, although there, there may be more that people talk about, you might hear about these subjects more in the news, but that's exactly our role, that we are not to be, you know, kind of uh, go where, wherever the wind goes in terms of the politics of the day. We need a, st a standard process, and that standard process allows for, like in the sex ed situation, it, it allows for people to opt out if, there, if there's a personal objection to, to, to the content. But the moment we start changing the process for because of one issue or one, one uh, political movement, regardless of what side it's on, then we're subject to uh, you know, something that's not fact-based, something that, so now we're teaching something else. We're teaching opinions, we're teaching beliefs. We need to uh, you know, stick with the facts and, and, and teach the kids that and then not get influenced by politics. Thank you. Chris, I guess. Yeah, I actually agree with most of the board members up here, folks up here, candidates, that the process should be the same. And I think Mr. Khan had the two key words here, fact-based. If we're producing a fact-based curriculum, the reason we separated history and sex ed from math and science is we all think well, math and science, of course, would be fact-based. History and sex ed should be fact-based as well. And by going through the process of staff input, teacher input, parent input, we can arrive at that fact-based curriculum. 
Now, sex ed in particular, I'm not sure why we're lumping it with history, but sex ed in particular, I think, is an area where this board does need to take a stand. Legislation has been passed in this state regarding comprehensive sex ed standards that a lot of parents don't think are age appropriate. I don't think they're age appropriate. I have nothing, uh, no concerns with teaching our children about health, about basic sex education, but some of these more advanced topics might not be age appropriate for the K through eight system. This board needs to actually take a stand, provide guidance to our staff and teachers about where we wanna go because the legislation specifically says that boards should take a stand and vote to approve or not approve the comprehensive standards. If we were to do that, the staff and the administration would know where to go with the curriculum development in this area. Thank you. And you can wait for 30 minutes, 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> you <laughs> did not adopt um, the comprehensive sex standards. Um, uh, teachers have not received training. Um, students have not uh, received any curriculum that was fully aligned to that uh, the national sex standards. And currently, the uh, health curriculum for eighth grade is under review. Um, so we really should not take a position on bills that are being considered. So with the bills that are before us, um, we have not taken a stand on it. Thank you. I, well, I think that's exactly the problem. The board hasn't taken a stand. But there, there is pending legislation that was taken with committee where it was going to be mandatory across the state that hasn't passed. So right now it's optional. And when you don't provide guidance on something where there is so much controversy out there, it distracts the board, it distracts the administration, it distracts teachers from their mission. The guidance hasn't been provided. Why don't we provide the guidance for the administration? Why don't we provide the guidance for our teachers as they're developing this curriculum as to which path they should take? When you don't provide guidance, you create confusion and you distract from the mission of educating our children. I'd like to use uh, my last um, Okay. My, my last time. Yep. <laughs> 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 yeah, I think this is, this is really a, a non-issue. So it's very important to understand. The national sex standard, we, we have taken this position by opting out. That is a position. Um, and so, if in fact it is, uh, if the law changes where we are, where we are required to do it, then it's a moot point for us taking the position is again just bringing politics and you know using the, the the school board as a pulpit to talk about what we don't like on the state level. The reality is, if it gets passed, then we'll have to use it. If it and currently we, our position is we haven't used it, so it's a non-issue. Okay. Are we ready to move on? Oh. Uh, yes. Oh. Can you get to answer. Can you repeat the original? <laughs> <laughs> question six, which is reflecting on the last question, how would your ideal process change, if at all, for board approval or uh, books and curriculum for history and sex ed? We are still on that topic. All right, gotcha. <laughs> Um, I always hung back to transparency. Um, when I worked for a public, public policy think tank, I always I actually worked on projects to make sure that government was as transparent with the taxpayers, parents, and citizens as possible. Um, I, I agree a lot with what Chris Darvis is saying, that there hasn't been a firm stance. I understand that they did not into the sex ed curriculum that's being passed, but I have teachers and family members and, and parents coming to me, coming to Chris, saying they're very worried that some of those same things are going to be developed in the new sex ed curriculum because they brought in a consultant that's going to teacher institute days that is an expert in implementing those same standards. So the lack of transparency, whether or not they're actually pushing to have those things implemented in the curriculum, there's not that trust in the community because there's a lack of transparency. Thank you. Learning standards are established by 
um, the state of Illinois. And those, um, those learning standards are then implemented through our educators. Um, the board monitors the progress. Um, you know, this parental um, involvement, it's a partnership. You know, we are a public school. We need to partner with our parents. Um, and we have that at District 15. We have parents as partners um, program. And, you know, I really believe um, that if we can uh, see eye to eye on this issue, that um, we can actually make great strides. Again, in my opening statement, I have to um, impress upon you. We have so much work to be done. And um, that work really gets done when we work together as a team. I'm happy to repeat the question. We are on your next. Yeah, if, if you would. Okay. You. Considering the strong differences of opinion in the community about parental involvement in curriculum selection, how would you determine which voices should receive the most weight in considering what is age or grade appropriate? Okay, so when we're talking about what's, what's age appropriate, I guess we're talking about any type of uh, any type of subject. I, I think that it has to be a partnership. But if you were to tell me, you know, what is the, you know, I, again, I would go with facts and with science as much as we can. We have uh, educators who have who have a, a long history of uh, and, and exposure to what other districts are doing and what the history of different books are are. Uh, you know, it, what the different history is. So I would lean on the expertise. I just, uh, I think that, you know, these are things that we don't want to have a situation where every single person's personal opinion is now driving an entire curriculum. That's just not untenable. I mean, I know but that's just not tenable. So I think I would lean on, on those voices and, um, uh, you know, make, make uh, educated decisions. So it's a tough question for sure. Um, okay, Chris. Yes. Yeah, so the question is which which voices should receive the most weight, and I think that is antithetical to what the whole concept of an open board meeting is all about. Every voice should have weight. I I look forward to serving at, at a minimum. I'm going to serve with at least one of the incumbents here uh, after being elected. Hopefully, being elected, hopefully I can earn your vote through this forum through my other uh, discussions and efforts. But I look forward to learning from them as well. We are going to agree on a lot of things. We're going to disagree on a couple of things. And I, when we disagree, I look forward to the discussions and the conversations so I can learn. And I hopefully that they'll be open-minded and learn from me. I look forward to hearing from our parents and our educators and our staff and our administrators so I can learn and so I can hear and so I can consider and use my reason and judgment to provide the best possible uh, vote for policies and procedures that will produce great academic outcomes for our children, safe and nurturing environments for our children, for our staff, and, uh, and a positive benefit for our taxpayers. That's what it's all about. Everybody gets a voice at the table. That's the whole concept of our of our system, and I look forward to, uh, to keeping that going. Thank you. Justin Hickey? Could you repeat it one more time? I'm sorry. Sure. Uh, sure. Considering the strong differences of opinion in the community about parental involvement in curriculum selection, how would you determine which voices should receive the most weight in considering what is age or grade appropriate? Yeah, so every every subject obviously um, is different and should be looked at through a, a, a different lens. So depending on the topic um, at hand, uh, you know, some voices might have different weight than others. But I will say that um, you know through these forums, I've heard a lot of candidates say that the parents are a stakeholder in the child's life. I think they're the primary stakeholder. Um, teachers definitely have a huge impact. They're super important, um, but parental involvement their input, um, being transparent with them so that they can have that input uh, is vitally important. Um, I would put a lot of weight on, on parents' voices. Um, and how, depending on what is actually age appropriate or isn't age appropriate, it, it, it's a little bit of a vague question, but I've seen examples of things that uh, some of the families have seen and implemented policy recently that um, I would view as objectionable, but it's still on the shelf. It's still um, being taught in some districts. So um, you can just look at those case by case. There's no reason we don't uh, have the time to do that. Samantha Ader. Sure. Um, so I think, 
you know, I agree that certain voices don't carry more weight than others. Of course, as a school district, our business is educating kids, so our educators and the voice of experts in the field um, do have to carry a certain amount of weight. Um, we have to make sure that our curriculum and the ways in which we're educating our kids is also in line with our vision and our values as a district. And it's also why things like our strategic plan are really important because those provide, they set the guardrails, they set the goals, they set the objectives for what we're trying to accomplish uh, as a district. On the family side, I would say, of course, we have open channels of communication. We all receive emails um, on an almost daily basis from family members out and community members. Um, but we also have to be conscious of having equitable representation of voice. Some of our families and some of our community members might not feel comfortable coming and speaking at open session, um, may not know English. And so we have to also be proactive in soliciting uh, voices that we may not hear from uh, on, on a daily basis. Thank you. Okay, um, I think we are only going to have time for maybe one more question. Two more? Okay. Um, all right, so we're going to start with uh, Samir Khan first on this one. Which of the measures that May 15 schools have taken have been most effective at keeping students safe? Are there any that you would eliminate, change, or add in order to improve school safety? Well, I think that the most important thing that the district has done in terms of safety is about a few years ago when we decided to uh, do some major construction. Now, these buildings are all very, very old, and so the, the, the vestibules here when, when you come into the schools were not really designed for heavy security or even you know the, the type of security that would be acceptable in this day and age. So when that construction was done, which was before the referendum, these were things that we realized uh, needed to be done before that, and we had major construction in many of the schools to, to make it happen. So that was a big, big undertaking, and I'm very happy that that's been done. I feel a lot better about things. In terms of additional measures, you know, I think we need to get to a time where we have more, um, and this is part of our, you know, moving 15 forward construction, where the new construction will have a lot more cameras, uh, a lot more cameras outside of, of the schools as well as inside. I think that will add to the security. So um, that's obviously our, our number one goal. Before we can do any learning, we got to make sure everyone's secure. Thank you. And Chris Arias. Can you repeat the question to start the exact wording again? Of course. Which of the measures that D15 schools have taken have been most effective at keeping students safe? Are there any that you would eliminate, change, or add to in order to improve school safety? In terms of adding, certainly, the moving 15 forward plan and the security assessment that's going to go forward as part of the overall maintenance and upgrade buildings is incredibly important, and I'm glad that we're doing it. In terms of what's happened, uh, as Mr. Khan said, I'm also very happy to see the double implementation of double door entrances with security, funneling through offices, et cetera, so you control access to the building. That's, we all know from uh, many of the unfortunate events that happened in this country that that is incredibly important. Uh, in terms of what I'd like to see going forward, I mean, frankly, I'd like to see us uh, maybe revisit the topic of what happens in the classroom to ensure that we have a safe, calm, non-disruptive uh, academic environment in our classrooms. I know the board just received a presentation in January regarding uh, discipline and, and student activity in the classroom. I wouldn't mind revisiting that discussion, frankly, just to see if there are ways or follow-up needed to ensure that our students are not disrupted in their academic progress. And frankly, that our staff are supported in trying to maintain order and discipline and a conducive learning environment in our classroom as well. So I'd love to see, frankly, I'd love to see us follow up on that January board discussion later this year. Thank you. Justin and Peggy, student safety change eliminate or add in order to improve. Thank you. Um, yeah, I would, I would uh, pretty much say a lot of what uh, Chris Dargis also said about, um, uh, well, let me back. Okay, so I have been approached by quite a few teachers that feel like um, when they have unruly or behavioral issues in the classroom, um, sometimes they feel like they aren't able to remove them or uh, you know, they don't have the tools at their discretion to remove um, problematic behavior from the classroom. They don't necessarily feel um, supported by, by the board. Um, you know, 
the discussion that happened on, in the board meeting in January is, is one example where um, I think that the board could take a leadership role saying, you know, we have your back, teachers, um, students should be safe as well. Um, any kind of behavioral issues that um, seem to be threatening should be addressed. And um, there should be an open line of communication about any of those risks. So I would say, just like a lot of the other topics that we've discussed tonight, we need to um, garner the experts, uh, and in this case, the experts are law enforcement. And so I'm proud of how our district has partnered with law enforcement to do assessments of the safety and security of our buildings. Of course, a big first step was the secure vestibules, um, but their expertise and their guidance is what helped inform uh, what was going to be included in the Moving 15 Forward Plan as safety and security measures. So things like those enhanced cameras, um, more exterior cameras, things like that, so we know who is around our building um, is incredibly important. And then also I would say prevention. So we talked a lot about the mental health needs of um, not only our students, but also of our community. Um, we've talked about how this uh, mental health needs of our students is is in some ways the second pandemic that we're experiencing, and we are in a crisis in that way. And so by investing in mental health, we're also investing in the safety and security of our schools. Thank you. And that, you know, that you've had this since um, Sandy Hook, we've had um, 3,000, over 3,000 mass shootings. <coughs> safety, school safety is, um, is a partnership between the police department, between parents, between the district. Um, thank you, Sam, for addressing the mental health issue. That is critical. Um, in District 15, we have annual safety drills. We have secure restrooms. We have a extensive vi um, visitor check-in process. We have school resource officers. Um, we'll have uh, outside surveillance cameras. Um, for parents, you, and the most important thing that you need to know is that your contact information must be up to date just in case you need to contact you um, through mail, text, web, website, or through or even a local call. It, school safety is, again, a partnership between all of these different parts. Thank you. Okay, everybody answered that one. We're gonna start with Chris Argus on the next question, which is, what is your opinion about local municipal campaigns accepting donations from politically motivated organizations? Would you or have you accepted monetary donations from PACs, unions, or outside organizations? Well, I'll start by saying I haven't received any donations from PACs, unions, or outside organizations, at least as of 8 o'clock this morning when I last checked. So if something came in this afternoon, I'll let you know. I think, look, I think it's just about transparency and disclosure. Uh, you know, look, this, this is a nonpartisan election. This should be nonpartisan. The education of our children should be nonpartisan. And when partisan players get involved in donating and supporting specific uh, candidates, uh, it can it can uh, change the atmosphere, frankly, and, and drive a, a partisan uh, flavor to uh, discussions that really uh, really shouldn't be a part of it. So, uh, you know, if people want to support other people, if unions want to support other candidates, that's fine. But I, I, I suppose, but at the end of the day. It really needs to be about transparency and mandatory disclosure, not people finding out about it later. If you're supported by a certain group, you should disclose you're supported by a certain group. As, you know, I'm supported by parents, by neighbors, by friends, by family, by uh, concerned folks in, in CCSD 15 who see what I see, that we see that our academics need improvement. We see that while we've done a good job, we need to do better. And now is the time to make that change. Now is the time to get that stronger leadership on the board, to get that stronger focus on academics as we're going through curricular changes as we're implementing middle school and full day kindergarten and all these other uh, changes that I can't talk about as the stop sign. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Justin, Peggy, same question. Yeah, so I have not received any funds from those um, politically driven groups or from public unions, um, but I think the transparency of campaign uh, finances is, is vitally important. Um, this term, if elected, will be negotiating the next teacher's union contract. The last one was signed for a 10-year term, which is unprecedented, and it's caused a lot of issues um, as we've gone through vast uh, different scenarios in the economy, COVID, everything else, it, it's tied our hands on a lot of things. So um, uh, if you're funded by a public union, that's okay, but there should be transparency on the table that 
you know, you're sitting there negotiating the next contract, um, you know, what interests are you negotiating it for? Um, I was a labor relations administrator for uh, Children and Family Services. I have a background in negotiating contracts. Um, that's gonna be one of the major things coming up. So if somebody's supported by a public union, um, I think that should be known to the public, to the teachers and everybody else. Thank you. Samantha Ader. Sure. Uh, so I have not received any donations from um, partisan organizations. Um, I did receive support from an organization called Leadership for Educational Equity, which um, supports school board candidates that are values aligned in terms of um, focus on closing academic gaps for kids. And I think you all have heard from my opening statement and hopefully in my responses um, that that's something that's really important to me. So um, I think it's important for any donations to that are accepted that they are aligned with your values and your vision for um, the district and for the office that you are running for. Um, and most of my support has been through families, uh, family, friends, colleagues, uh, network uh, out in the community who believe in the vision that we have for District 15 um, and that we are preparing a future ready district and building on the foundation and the momentum that we've had over the last four years. Thank you. Linda Hunt. You were to get um, donations, um, but it's also endorsements. Um, it, I agree with everyone with what everyone has said. It's important to be transparent because we have to know what influences your decision making. I know early on in the election, um, a local group actually um, request for our endorsement, um, request that, uh, that if we were to ban books, that they would give us their endorsement. Um, and that's important to know as well. Um, so obviously, um, they, we disagree and um, that, that group, that organization um, has not endorsed me or um, Samantha or Thank you. Yeah. Question. Question is, uh, what is your opinion about local municipal campaigns accepting donations from politically motivated organizations? Would you or have you accepted monetary donations from PACs, unions, or outside organizations? Okay, so I, I have not accepted uh, that, that sort of uh, a donation, and I don't think it should be that way. There's a reason why we have non nonpartisan elections for our, for our school board. We want to keep politics out of these elections. That's something that um, is just so critical, you know, and it's not so much just the, just the fact of where you're accepting money, it's, it's the issue that, that you're taking on. There are issues that are about teaching kids, and then there are other issues that are about the, you know, the other national uh, issues or state issues. I think this is a local election, it's a local school board, we care about these kids and, and that they're educated, and that's primarily it. So I don't think we need to, we should take money, we haven't been taking money, and we should keep politics out of this election. Thank you. Um, I think, are we gonna wrap up now, Kelsey? Keep going, we're gonna wrap. <laughs> okay, um, I think we are in the essence of time. I was told eight o'clock and we're at eight ten. So I think we need to wrap now. Um, so we'll go with our closing statements. And um, you get one and a half minutes. Um, we're going to start with Justin, just because that is the order we've been going in. Let's hold it up to give everybody. And of course, that's the last question first. So, otherwise, I might just switch it up. But we'll just go with this first. Thank you all. Oh, yeah. Sorry. No. Uh, thank you all for having me again. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you, explaining sort of where my background is, who I am. Um, Again, I live in the community, trying to start a family right now. Um, I have a background in public administration, labor relations. I wanna bring those skill sets to the, the board so that we can negotiate good contracts, uh, both for the, the citizens, the parents, the taxpayers, and to give the teachers the tools that they need. Um, we've seen things go in the wrong direction for the past five years. We're losing student population. Our proficiencies are down. Uh, the community feels like there's a lack of transparency. I want to restore all that. I think that I can do a good job at it. Um, and uh, I look forward to the election and hopefully uh, serving as a member of the board and representing you. Thank you. Samantha Ader, next. Uh, thank
thank you again to our hosts, uh, my fellow candidates, and everyone for being here tonight. Uh, in closing, I want to emphasize that I'm here to do what's best for every child in District 15. This is how I have led as a board member. I am fiercely protective of our students, especially the students that need us most, and I'm grounded in my values of justice, growth, kindness, and authenticity. Uh, Wendy Zubair and I are ready to tackle the challenges and opportunities ahead of us. I hope tonight gave you a clear view of our vision for District 15 and the type of leadership we will continue to bring to the district over the next four years, um, as well as the work ahead to make our district future ready. I'm also proud that this morning, the three of us were endorsed by the Daily Herald because of our steady leadership for District 15 um, and the way that we have supported our kids, our community, and understand our role as board members over the last four years. Uh, if you want to learn more about us, you can visit aderhuntcon.com. Um, there are yard signs and flyers we have out in the hallway if you're interested, um, and we will also stick around at the end um, if you have any further questions for us. Um, so join us to help secure the future of District 15. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hunt. Friends, neighbors, thank you so much for listening, for digesting the information um, that you heard, and for considering the impact of your vote on the future of District 15. Our schools are the foundation of our community. They are a site of self-discovery and learning, where students connect and build relationships. They are places of inspiration. Help us create the District 15 of tomorrow. Help us um, prepare future-ready students. Help us build a learning community that motivates and challenges every student to be their best. I believe, as Nelson Mandela once said, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. So, go get our hunt on for District 15, April 4th. Super Khan. Once again, thanks for everyone for coming today. Um, when I look back at the last eight years, I begin to reflect uh, of what our schools and our children mean to this community. What goes on in the classrooms and the playgrounds is just amazing. To see a student feel that spark of learning something new, meeting a new friend, making a teacher proud. This is why serving on the board has been the greatest honor of my life. To be able to play a role in changing the trajectory of our kids and their families, well, I, I don't know if there's a more worthwhile pursuit. We have a wonderful, diverse board that has really put forth amazing changes at District 15. When I first ran, everybody wanted full day kindergarten, but we didn't. Everybody complained about the boundaries, Well, we changed them. There's so much more to do. Accomplishing these things means to focus at the ta on the task at hand and leaving politics for the national and the state government to deal with. At District 15, when we focus on the kids, good things happen. I know for me, Samantha and Wenda, being on the board is our passion. We feel it in our bones. It's not a political pulpit. It's all. It's, it's the only thing we want. It's the only thing we want to do. So I humbly ask for your for your vote for Ader Hunt Khan on April 4th. Thanks. Thank and Chris Targas. Well, thanks again for for having this and hosting us, and thank you all for coming out tonight. When I was in college, actually, I I was a teacher's aide at an elementary school. I'm a Russian language speaker. I was there for Russian immigrant children who didn't speak English. And I was in there, you know, first hand day to day because I cared about the kids. It was fun over the course of the year building the relationships and, and you know having them run to meet you when they see you pulling up on that Tuesday afternoon for their extra educational uh, to meet their extra educational needs. My sister is a teacher at an elementary school in a neighboring district. And I hear from her every single day about the challenges faced by our teachers and the administration and the staff with the, everything we've gone through over the past several years. I care deeply and passionately about the education of our children to the benefit of our community. I care first and foremost about the academic outcomes we're able to achieve. I appreciate everything that has been done. I live in District 15 for a reason. I love this district. I love our schools. I sent all my children to them, as I mentioned. But we need to do better because we've seen academic progress stall and decline in this district. We need to do better to support our students and put our priorities to improving those academic outcomes. We need to do better in supporting our staff and our teachers. Teachers are quitting all over the country. It isn't just about money. It's about how much support do they get from the board? How much support does the, they get from the administration? How much support does the administration get from the board so that they can provide that support to our teachers so that their voices can be heard? I'm committed to doing what's right for our children, I'm committed to doing what's right for our educators, and I'm committed to doing what's right for this community, and I ask for your vote. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, now we have a word from the Parent Teacher Association. Hi everyone, uh, Dan, come on up here for a minute. My name is Julie Holtman and I'm the Northwest Suburban Council PTA Vice President of Programs. Just a little history, my kids grew up, went through District 15. My, old, my youngest is now a freshman at UW Wisconsin. But PTA and District 15 is so important to me that I wanted to come back and assist our council in rebuilding and bringing more programming to our local unit, our local families. So I want to introduce Dan uh, McCullough. He is our um, president of our council. Just wanted to let you know a little bit about what the Northwest Suburban Council is and what we do. Northwest Suburban Council is proud to have, first of all, reached out to the League of Women Voters of the Palatine area to help bring this event to you tonight. Um, part of PTA, one of the biggest things about PTA is we are the largest advocacy association for children in the country. And so we are proud to be able to partner with the League tonight to be able to bring this to you. Um, uh, and thank you to Kathy and all your volunteers. Um, Northwest Suburban Council is the PTA council that oversees all 15, District 15 PTAs within our school district. So at this point we do have 20 local PTAs. And uh, we are the liaison between the District 15 administration as well as our Northwest Cook region as well as Illinois PTA and National PTA. Because we are a part of Illinois and National PTA and we are able to provide all of those wonderful programming options and resources to our local units. Um, I wanted to really quick tell you the mission of the PTA because I think as you guys were talking tonight, I think you all can agree with this. Um, the PTA's mission is to make every child's potential a reality by engaging and empowering families and communities to advocate for all children. So as you see, this program really was a perfect thing for us to help work on tonight because we want to advocate uh, for parent education and engagement. Um, PTA is an advocacy association, again, we provide leadership development resources to our local PTA leaders who are all volunteers, we're all volunteers. And we do this because we love our children. We want our kids to have the best education that they can have and to reach that full potential. We provide parent engagement, um, parent engagement and support in classrooms and schools, as well as providing programs and resources that enhance the educational opportunities of all of our students. I just want to tell you, we were so proud to partner with the League tonight. I do want to say that um, our council did also partner with District 15 just uh, at the end of January to work with Palatine Police Department to provide a parent's role in the uh, emergency plan um, program and presentation, which is available on the, the District 15 YouTube, which is great information for all parents. We hope everyone reaches out and takes a look at that, as well as we provide all kinds of things like arts education things such as our reflections uh, program, uh, which is a national program that we bring to all of our students here. So we just want to thank you all. Um, thank you for giving us the opportunity. Thanks, Dan. Thank you for all coming out. Thank you for coming out. And um, again, thanks to the League. Um, we are truly happy to be able to uh, provide this and help. Election Day is April 4th. Thank you all candidates. Very nice to 